Good afternoon from COP26 in Glasgow. My name is uh, Giampiero Nacci. I'm acting director in the Green Economy and Climate Action team at the European Bank for Construction and Development. Uh, thank you for joining us this Saturday afternoon in this joint side event with FAO and EBRD on decarbonization in action. Today is Nature Day at the COP, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to discuss with leading sector experts about what decarbonization means in the food value chains. The challenges that the sector has to go through are really formidable. Uh, to reach net zero and also to increase sustainability along food value chains. The whole global food sector has to feed extra 2 billion people by 2050. This entails increasing the food output by 50%. All of this transformation needs to happen without expanding the land footprint of the sector to leave space for reforestation and rewilding of nature. Agriculture forestry and land use account for about one-fourth of global greenhouse gas emissions. If we then take the whole food system in consideration, so looking at the refrigeration, food processing, logistics, packaging, actually this number becomes one-fourth. This is equivalent to uh, roughly four times the emissions of the European Union. However, this transformation also opens up the opportunity for new business model and new investments. And this is what we are going to discuss today with our panel of experts. We have here in the MDB studio in Glasgow, Natalia Zhukova from the EBRD and Martial Bernou from the FAO. And connected online, we have Anastasia Bilic from Arnica Group and Guy Hoge from uh, Louis Dreyfus Company. But before we involve our panel, I would like to share with you the main findings of an FAO EBRD study on decarbonization, carbon neutrality along food value chains. We have connected online um, Nuno Santos, senior economist at the FAO, who will share a few slides and introduce the topic. Nuno, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Giampiero, and hello to everyone. I think um, someone in the studio will be changing the slides. I'm extremely happy to be here and talk about this fascinating and urgent topic. Uh, that of decarbonizing agri-food systems and with such an interesting panel just following up on this. Uh, what I will present is hopefully short and is based on a brief that actually has a rather long title and starts with the expression, the shortest path, which is maybe a bit of irony. So what I'll present is really a very abbreviated version of a much lengthier study by FAO and EBRD on carbon neutrality and food systems, which will come out early next year. I don't think I need to go into the details. You've already mentioned it, Giampiero, that why we need to focus on agri-food systems from farm to fork, they account for a major part of anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And they're also uh, key emitters of specific greenhouse gases like methane. It's become normal in many circles to talk about the fact that extracting and consuming each ton of coal, each barrel of oil and each cubic foot of natural gas comes with significant costs to human health, to the economy, society, ecosystems alike. I think we're increasingly coming to recognize this is also true for steaks, for milk and bread. We know that there are substantial economic benefits from investing in carbon neutrality, and these are extremely important, especially as we see estimates for the social cost of carbon going up according to many economists. So we've been from going from the $50 per ton estimated by the US administration back in 2013, all the way to Stern and Stiglitz with $100 by 2030 to align with one and a half degree target, and possibly as high as $200 per ton if rising temperatures were to impact uh, growth rates instead of the just levels of GDP. So this, what this means is that a lot of technologies, a lot of things that uh, food systems um, can put in place become more attractive once you, you start thinking about social costs of carbon. So if we think about all the emissions of the sector, we're talking about billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of actual benefits of de decarbonizing. So these are all big numbers in terms of costs and, and, and et cetera. But what we know is that the sector is part of the problem, uh, but also not not only a cause, but also a victim and potentially part of the solution. Being a victim is clear because despite advances in controlled environment, 
agriculture and a lot has been discussed recently on this by and large food systems rely on the weather and and of course part of the solution naturally because of the importance of forests of the oceans and of soils in the carbon cycle and so how uh, there's a lot of, that can be said about how food systems are able to contribute to store carbon so next slide please so I'll, I'll just go through some of this um, factors. So in agri-food systems, what are the key reasons and drivers for corporate action uh, from big multinationals all the way to smallholder farmers? So the graph on the right was produced by the We Mean Business Coalition in 2015, and it's based on corporate surveys. The not so fun fact is that the We Mean Business Coalition was pushing at the time for emissions stabilizing by 2020, which we know just didn't take place. The graph is also interesting because it's very much what we concluded from our study on agri-food systems. So one of the first key conclusions is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the sector because there's no single major driver of decarbonization at present. And this really reflects the complexity of agri-food systems across commodity types, but also geographies, business models, et cetera. Uh, if we think about these four groups of drivers on the left listed in the slide, First, companies are going for investments that improve efficiency, and this is clear in the case of energy. And this can be seen across the sector, but really depend on local conditions. So, for example, availability of renewable energy sources is one of the issues, so it's not always the case, specifically in multinationals in, in specific geographies where this is not available. Second, we do see new market opportunities um, and also the ability to improve brand value as something important for companies. Uh, but this is particularly the case for companies that cater to niche markets with consumers valuing environmentally sound products. This is not the rule across the sector. Most companies in agri-food systems deal with customers today for which price matters. And we still don't see carbon labels very often um, or we see them becoming the new calorie uh, just uh, the day after tomorrow. So beyond the individual consumers, an area that is gaining some traction is that of green public procurement and all the B2B channels, which can support some of the greening of food systems. But this is important because a lot of what is said about the consumer, what we find is that it's, it's a mix of what we see in terms of there's a difference between uh, the willingness to pay and what is said in specific services, talking about concerns that people have with climate. Third, companies are really interested in anticipating or adapting to regulatory and policy shifts. And this is something we've seen and it's not surprising, but what they do is really a wait and see and they're waiting. And I think the COP26 is obviously something they're carefully uh, looking at because this is a clear driver because we don't, we're not in an environment where uh, carbon is well-priced. Uh, on finance, I won't say much. There's been quite a lot of um, discussion recently, and there are trillions in institutional investors that can help drive change. Um, a big uh, part of it, so about 30 trillion already reportedly uh, going for ESG type investing, but still with a lot of problems associated to it. Um, and we also have to recognize that every food systems, when we talk about them, we are often talking about privately owned firms up to farmers. So uh, there's a lot of potential in innovative finance, but we're still very much at an early stage. So next slide. Uh, beyond the hype, what we find um, in, in, in this um, journey towards um, a carbon neutral or low carbon food systems is that costs of becoming carbon neutral can be high. They'll depend on the supply chain and the supply chain stage. So if you're a tea producer or an olive oil company, it can be much more, can be much more of a, a low hanging fruit. Uh, you, can, you can go through great lengths through adjustments in your farming, which can even have co-benefits and improvements in terms of, of sustainability of your soils. Uh, also with changes to your processing and logistics, it, you can get there. Uh, if you're a meat or a milk producer, it's much harder and you need to offset much more of your emissions if you want to reach neutrality or net zero. Um, so the challenges are very different depending on the situation. The weight of logistics can be very important in specific cases, uh, so on and so forth. A second issue is that there's limited data to inform a lot of these life cycle uh, analyses that, that are behind uh, carbon neutrality or carbon quantification and, and all the MRV uh, processes. 
there's also poor governance associated to this and a proliferation of standards. So this is clearly a problem. And many of the journeys we see by agri-food system uh, players are homemade. Not all of them are third-party certified. And even when that happens, you ask yourself which third-party certifier to use. So this can be an obstacle to food system actors also to, to uh, go on this journey. Uh, a third one, um, proliferation of labels. They don't help consumers understand and value carbon. You not only have thousands of eco labels in general uh, already in supermarkets uh, around the world, but already many, there are also many labels on carbon neutrality and they're often associated to this or that service provider or consultancy firm. There's an issue of process, but also an issue of governance. And again, this comes to a disservice of consumers, but also ultimately impacts those actors that would like to move because it creates problems of, of reputation and problems of trust in the system. Um, so on access to finance, uh, I've mentioned that before, uh, there's a proliferation again of rating agencies. There's inconsistent disclosure requirements. We know uh, even now at the COP, there's much discussion about this. There's a hope uh, in what's being done, including the work of the Climate Disclosure Standards Board and others. We're still far away from harmonized reporting and disclosure as we do for company financials. We do think this can be a major game changer, particularly given the size of traders. And we, we'll have a discussion. Uh, Guy represents one of, of those companies uh, because of the size of these companies in food systems. If you take for example, the likes of, say, Olam, they work with more than 5 million farmers, and, and these farmers are associated to about 14 million hectares, which is about the agricultural area of Poland. Um, if you take the cost of goods sold of the five largest soft commodity merchants in the world, you have about $200 billion annually that are purchased. These are huge figures, and it shows how you can also enact change through, through the financial side. Um, on the left, next slide, please. Just thanks. So unsurprisingly, we have very uneven levels of adoption across the sector of carbon neutrality or, or low carbon uh, uh, paths. Um, and, and some companies just focus on quantification. So on the left, I, I show you a graph that we've produced that kind of tries to map all these, these pathways. And you can see it in the, in the publication and the brief. Uh, some companies just focus on quantification and or, or disclosure. Only a few rely on third-party independent certification. Um, offsetting and reductions are used very differently across subsectors, and it really depends on the situation. So uh, companies also target different scopes, and the use of labels is not obvious, as mentioned. Slide five, next slide, the last one, as I, I think we, we need to conclude. Uh, given the, 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 the discussion that will start afterwards. So what are the action areas that we propose? So I think first and foremost, we need policy strategies and roadmaps that have clear targets by governments. And this is, has been the topic of the COP to a great extent. This is very clear and it will be very difficult to go beyond mild commitments for a lot of companies without that. Uh, governments, they play a central role in adjusting incentives for the private sector to move to carbon neutrality, particularly since I, as I mentioned, consumer demand at present is still not a, a clear major driver for a lot of companies in the sector uh, and across systems. Uh, and so there's a need for additional market incentives and regulations to drive the accurate valuation of price and pricing of carbon. So governments can also actively develop new opportunities to achieve carbon neutrality through, for example, high quality national carbon marketplaces specific to agriculture, but also the use of green public procurement, et cetera. Number two, we have a need for still improved tools and methods. I'm not going to great, uh, to great lengths on this, but we need more standardized approaches for, for tracking emissions, for, for reporting on them, databases, development, accounting methodologies, there's a lot to be done. And especially the, the key word is, is standardization. And of course, standardizing uh, carbon accounting disclosures in line with what we do, for example, with financial reporting could be um, in, in, enable a lot of transparency, both for consumers, but also investors. Third, we need to develop governance around all of this. So just having the 
tools and methods, but without appropriate governance systems will not work because you need uh, public action for this. You need that um, uh, companies, they know what's reliable and what's not in terms of the agents that are providing certifications and, all, and, and the different standards. So this is very important. Uh, fourth, you need direct support. And this is important because of number one. So number four is really related because you, you, you need to price carbon. So if we don't, if, if the consumer is not paying for it, uh, taxpayers need to pay it or someone needs to pay. So you need at one point to directly support the carbonization because we're talking about an externality. And what we see in the sector is, is that while there are win-wins, many of the interventions have costs and they also uh, require, um, they, they have, uh, and so companies may be a, a bit timid about going that route. So they, you need public intervention, also development partners, partners can support uh, uh, companies and actors in food systems to subsidize their efforts in reporting, um, specific, specifically when carbon externalities are not correctly priced. There's also direct support that can be uh, provided through concessional financing, uh, subsidies, and other forms uh, that can help companies decarbonize on a wider scale. Uh, it also applies to development of green financial products and financing options, because we know that a lot of food system actors would not have equal access to these. And so the issue of inequality is very important, and, and this goes all the way to smaller. Finally, there's also a need to develop capacities uh, throughout and share knowledge. This is not just about consumer awareness, but also making green technologies known, supporting dissemination of best practices, innovative finance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is all an important agenda. I, I wanted to thank you for the time and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nuno. I think your uh, presentation really helped set in the scene uh, and lead us to the conversation with our panelists. I just would like to remind that this study is already available in the uh, ebrd.com website uh, in the COP26 uh, pages. But let me now shift to our panel. Um, I propose perhaps to start and uh, break a bit the ice. It would be great if you can introduce yourself and uh, tell us you know, why decarbonization in food matters to you and how it is linked to your work and to your organizations. Uh, perhaps let's start with, with Natalia and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, continue in the, in the room and then move to the uh, uh, colleagues uh, connected online. Natalia, please. Thank you, Jean Piero. I'm Natalia Zhukova, Director of Agribusiness Team at ABID. Uh, the bank is working practically 100% uh, with private client, uh, clients in agribusiness. And over 30 years, we have invested uh, over 13 billion euro in uh, 800 projects uh, working with private cli clients. And we care about uh, decarbonization because we simply cannot live without food. And we everybody calls for emergency or urgent action, and I think financial sector is part of it for sure. I'm sure we'll speak further about drive uh, uh, and how financial institutions can help uh, trigger the agenda. But we care because uh, uh, also because 40% of our financing are SMEs. And SMEs, we all know, deliver 80% of the global food uh, in the world. So from this perspective, there is a clear way uh, to go on this decarbonization journey, even uh, uh, for smaller clients of ours. Uh, and I'm not even talking about multinational, as Guy will talk, I'm sure, today about more about it. If you look at UK only, then 50% uh, of decarbonization can come from SMEs. So that's why it also matters to us. Thanks a lot, Natalia. Uh, I'd like now to uh, ask the same question to Martial. And thank you for being with us. I know that you're very busy with the negotiations. So we really appreciate your availability today. Martial. So thank you so much. Perhaps starting to respond to, to your question, why carbon neutrality? But a personal aspect also. Basically, I started my career very long ago, but uh, it was in Brazil uh, at the Rio Earth, Earth Summit. And uh, first, I was working like on appraising greenhouse gas emission, and then uh, think, and, but it was a research angle. And slowly, you know, I moved to the, to the more science policy interface. Now I am at FAO, 
I'm in an office, uh, office in charge of climate change, biodiversity, and environment. So we have an office in charge of looking at all the activities of FAO, what has the impact in terms of climate change, biodiversity, environment, and what also those three aspects impact our work. Uh, so this is basically uh, uh, at FAO, the climate change agenda, it's really a growing agenda. We had our first climate change strategy in 2017. We are renewing now this year our climate change strategy because we are also implementing a new framework strategy for this decade. And IPCC is really clear. We have this decade to act. So that's why we are reshaping FAO to respond to that challenge. Um, we are really looking at the, what we call internally the for better. So it's a better production for better nutrition with a better environment and better livelihood for leaving no one behind. This is also really important because I guess we will mention that behind the production system, we have people, we have farmers, we have companies, we have retailers and we have consumers. So this is all those people that we also need to put into the balance. And um, just to end also on the FAO umbrella, we are now working with 20 uh, program priority area and one is dedicated to climate change mitigation and adaptation. So is exactly uh, that priority area responding to your question. And I will end here. Thank you very much, Marcel. And actually, thank you also for bringing the attention on the people. You know, sometimes when we talk about the trillions needed for the, the transformation, we sometimes for, forget that, let's say, there are people at the, uh, uh, at the, at the core of this transformation. Uh, let me go now to uh, Anastasia Bilic. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased to have you uh, with us today. So t tell us your story. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jean Piero. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anastasia Bilic, and at Arnica, I'm responsible for sustainable development. And I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you, Uderdi and our team, uh, teams for the invitation. So um, as for your question, I must admit that the answer here is very simple. I believe that um, there is no company that is going to survive and develop, which does not put sustainability in a core of its activities. Being sustainable today is not about some fancy certification or some trendy things to do in the company. Sustainability today is an urgency and our duty to nature, to community, and to future generations. Sustainability is a complex tool at the same time that gives hope and helps companies to make a positive environmental impact, but also improves their economic and social efficiency. In our company at Arnik Organic, uh, decarbonization is a part of a comprehensive sustainability strategy that is based on ESG and United Nations sustainability goals and mainly is driven by environmentally and market-based factors. So regarding environmental-based factors, we are producers of primary agriculture products. So we are on the production side. We work on land, natural resources are our all core input, favorable climate conditions are the best fertilizer for us. But in recent times, we are under great pressure because of climate change lack of moisture, extreme winds and frosts, extreme high temperatures during vegetation periods, uh, time shifts in field operations. All those factors force us to create change and with our own example, to urge other farmers, smaller farmers, to make this change. Biodiversity conservation, water preservation, carbon dioxide emission control, non-use of mineral fertilizers on our fields and avoidance of chemical pollution, that's the least that we can do in environmental aspect. And another driver for us in this decarbonization journey is market, of course. Establishing our company as a carbon neutral supplier of agricultural commodities will change our market positioning. That's simple. New type of clients with the same set of emission reduction goals might become our strategic partners. New type of consumers that are guided by new values and want to consume sustainable food with no cost to environment, those are our new stakeholders. Furthermore, emission reduction or decarbonization strategy could lead us 
to cheaper green financing and could also provide us the access to new investment opportunities in order to finance our climate resilient solutions and carbon management activities. I must admit that today the wind of sustainability is really favorable for us as a company. Policies are being developed. Climate agenda is in a priority list of lots of companies worldwide, as well as being supported on national and international levels. Investors and lenders are reinforcing their finances on, to businesses that are actually doing and develop sustainable solutions. Consumers are expressing their tolerance to brands that are environmentally friendly. And thus, I want to encourage other small and medium-sized companies to develop and follow their sustainable decarbonized pathways if they haven't done that yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastasia, for, uh, uh, for uh, providing your perspective. Uh, Guy, what is your own view? And I'd like also to understand a bit the perspective of, uh, of a big global traders like LDC. Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, John Piero. And, and again, thanks very much to, to you and the bank for the opportunity to participate today in, uh, in a topic that is, is crucial. Um, I think uh, it's tough to, to really improve on what uh, Natalia said, that really the, you know, the future of food depends on, on decarbonization um, in so many different ways from you know, understanding what can be grown where in future. Um, you know, Anastasia talked about the extreme weather events that we're witnessing globally that either through severe drought or the exact opposite, um, you know, really either impair growing seasons or uh, actually massively reduce availability of, of food that the world relies on for, for flows around the world. So the, the vagaries and inconsistencies of food supply we notice are, are growing really quite dramatically. Um, I mean, other obvious things we see as an example, you know, in, in supply chains like coffee, uh, you know, the altitude at which coffee is a viable crop in a country like Colombia is going up every year. Uh, they're going to run out of mountains soon um, as a direct result of, of, of climate impact. So, you know, we see urgently the need to, to mitigate climate effects on on. Uh, you know, the, the, the global uh, production environment for food is, is critical. I mean, for us, as, as one of the, the big global food processors and merchants that Nuno referenced in his presentation, um, you know, and, and as significant investors in processing capacity and, and logistics capacity, uh, you know, where we invest, where we anticipate the need for efficient logistics uh, ability and capacity will be impacted by where we feel you know product will be able to be grown in future so um, those decisions become significantly more difficult for for us as well but uh, really a, a fundamental um, issue as well for us is one of is one of cost if we can if we can reduce the amount of energy required for us to, to process um, or to move commodities, we reduce the cost per ton of, of getting product from, from surplus to deficit. So, you know, by, by being proactive in managing both our energy consumption and the resultant carbon emissions downwards, we have, uh, we have a positive effect on, on our own costs, both as a company and as an industry that, that benefit the markets in, in which we operate. So there is a good business case in addition to the whole future of food argument that, that means decarbonizing makes great sense for companies like ours. Thank you very much, Guy. And I'm, I'm really pleased that both you and Anastasia, in fact, also touched upon the, the issue of climate risk and how it affects really your operations, your business. Actually, I'd like to come back to you, Anastasia, and uh, 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 touch upon a bit 
some of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, issues associated to your organization. Arnica is a, is a leading, is the largest, in fact, uh, producer and exporter of uh, organic commodities in Ukraine. You are not only a market leader in that area, but you're also an early mover. So it would be great if you can share with us a bit of uh, uh, um, some, some information about your experience uh, in, in bringing sustainability at the core of your uh, strategy and your operations. And I'm particularly interested to, to understand a bit the standards, the tools that you're applying and how they connect to your business. Well, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we've started our decarbonization journey uh, just recently, and we've already made several steps, several mistakes, and, uh, but even more, and I hope not mistakes, are uh, expecting us uh, in future. But uh, there, are some, there is some scope of work that we've uh, focused uh, on currently, and this scope of work consists of several tasks within this decarbonization, the whole decarbonization story. The first one is um, that we set a baseline definition, like carbon calculations that uh, we are doing now, they are covering 15,000 hectares of organic certified land that we operate. And currently, unfortunately, we don't have any benchmark to rely on in our calculations. The second step that, uh, is, that we expect to do is to develop and to justify the carbon management plan, including land management measures and other applicable sustainable practices. Uh, afterwards, uh, we are uh, expecting to access, um, to access financial viability and sensitivity of uh, the project, uh, the carbonization project, depending on carbon offsets markets conditions. Uh, the next steps to measure, verify, and report, of course, and the last but not least is crediting. That includes third-party verification of the carbon savings and issuance of carbon credits by the carbon certification standard. But the very first thing that each company uh, should start with in such projects is a detailed mapping of its operations and the whole value chain. And if you think that your carbon track is obvious, measures to be taken uh, are understandable or metrics and methodologies are well known, so you shouldn't be so confident. Um, thus, I would like to emphasize on some of the problems, the challenges that um, the company will face or that we've already faced when starting decarbonization activities in our company. The lack of universal standardized knowledge and expertise. Uh, you should be ready to invest in your teams and in new qualifications and expertise. The uncertainty of carbon mechanisms and the absence of clear ready to go solutions for the companies that are on the production side. So the existing methodologies have something in common, of course, but still they differ a lot in their requirements, in their calculations, in their inputs and validation processes. The uncertainty of carbon offsets markets. So the voluntary markets are challenging and uh, prices are volatile and emission trading schemes are still under development, for example, in Ukraine. So the financial viability and the return on the green investment are not so clear and not so obvious. Emission reduction projects are um, at the same time they are data driven. So the accuracy of the data that we are working now and that we operate and put in our modeling is now under question. So, but carbon as wheat or corn or any other type of commodity should be traceable through the whole value chain. And the last but not least, financial burdens. The environmental transformation that we are uh, doing now in the company, it's also about economic transformation. Each step on the way to sustainable development costs, from certification to compliance to management practices, everything costs. And I believe that decarbonization will become a mainstream very, very soon, and a financial sector that will support uh, those endeavors of companies can become a major driver uh, of this process. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anastasia. You're touching upon some very, very critical elements. And I would like perhaps to, 
to continue the conversation about data and information uh, with, with Guy. Uh, as, a, as a global uh, you know, leading uh, uh, food and agricultural commodities uh, trader, uh, your company is really in the middle of, of the supply chains. You, know, you both source food and deliver food to distributors and consumers. And actually, sustainability, I believe, really affects all segments of your business. Would like to perhaps explore and expand a bit what Anastasia mentioned in terms of data management, data availability, data accuracy, also in connection not only to your customers and also your, uh, if you like, reporting and transparency uh, requirements, but also in respect to your investors. Yeah, I, I guess the good thing about speaking after Anastasia is she's doing a lot of the, the hard work for me. But uh, no, I, I, I think uh, one really crucial thing that she touched on was the the growing link between the sustainability performance and the metrics that companies like ours report on and the way in which we're financed. There's this growing link that is morphing into you know, financing as a tool to reward good behavior and to penalize bad, which is, is again, you know, a, an added business case. And, and EBRD as a bank is, is at the forefront of, of those efforts. So I think that's to be applauded and encouraged. Um, I think other, other elements around data provision, I mean, looking at our own experience when we first started measuring and monitoring and reporting on our scope one and two emissions as a company, our data was pretty poor, if we're honest. You know, we were forever in subsequent sustainability reports having to issue corrections from the previous year's data where we'd acknowledge that we we made mistakes or errors or we hadn't included something in our calculations. So fortunately, over time, both our knowledge and ability and expertise in measuring and reporting has improved dramatically, as has the technology to help us and the expertise in the form of knowledge and consultants that we can call on to, to improve our own processes. Um, so, you know, everything I think for business is moving in the right direction. To, to make sure that what you're putting into the public domain is, is accurate. And if it's verified externally by you know, a credible surveyor or an external export, uh, expert, uh, all the better um, as, it, uh, you know, uh, as it gives added credibility to, to what you're, you're publicly reporting. So those are all crucial elements, I would say, in sectorally making sure that you know agriculture is is putting its true profile and efforts to reduce that profile into the public domain that's that's certainly the goal we have uh, it sounds exactly the same as anastasia's and and sectorally you know others were, are are doing the same and and following suit so i think that's uh, you know that's where we get to to critical mass and scale as a, as an industry I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you very much, Guy. Let me now shift again to our studio here in Glasgow. Um, Natalia, this COP has been particularly important to reflect and highlight, emphasize, in fact, the role of finance to uh, support the low carbon transition. Um, can you please tell us you know, the way you see the role of finance really to support, particularly the private sector, in the decarbonization? Of course, you know, with a, with a clear reference to the food value chains? Well, clearly finance is a drive of change, that's for sure. And on a broader scale, we need way more finance to be directed towards agribusiness because if you look at the estimates of annual needs for money uh, going into climate adaptation for uh, agriculture, food and forestry, we need around 7 to 7.6 billion dollars per year and uh, at the same time if you look at the existing climate aligned bond universe it's only over three percent that goes to agriculture so so there's no not only a need for more money but also for their redirecting money towards agribusinesses 
Uh, finance can be obviously a trigger for decarbonization paths because we at the BID working with private clients like uh, LDC uh, and hopefully Annika, we really promote a uh, change approach. We promote, um, we pretty much make our financing conditional on achieving certain results. So there is uh, uh, a result-based metrics and we are looking at the climate impact and climate change uh, being taken into account. We push our client to kind of have greater ambition and make it not only conditional but also sometimes even contractual in our financing to undertake this journey together with us. At the same time, we are not only demanding, we help uh, our clients to make sure that the whole financing is linked as we say, to a journey jointly with the VID. So we, our brilliant uh, agribusiness advisory team, for example, provides a lot of technical assistance, knowledge transfer, uh, trainings, which is linked to particular projects with private clients, and that helps tremendously because it, we are not talking only we give you money now and then we forget about you, no. We are really building partnerships over many years <coughs> and continue this path. And then I really wanted to, to say that <clears throat> it was interesting to hear from Anastasia about uh, mistakes on the way. And I think what financial sector does not fully embrace yet is kind of a um, certain level of tolerance towards failure. Uh, and this is something that is difficult to quantify because we obviously want to work in a commercially viable scenario and we may want to make sure that our clients, even if they kind of have greater ambition, but they embark on the path of economically viable models and profitable models, even though sustainability is becoming big word, not only from nature perspective, but also from economics perspective. And maybe the last point as an example, uh, to make it a bit more practical, we, I don't know, financed recently online uh, re food retailer. As part of our financing package, we incentivize the company to develop local uh, and sustainable food supply chain. We ask the, the company to introduce a uh, new uh, packaging service line, which makes the whole packaging of, of this uh, play uh, zero waste and reusable. And the third point that was part of the financing was uh, moving the local farmers that they work with into organic uh, move from conventional into more sustainable practices. We also do, for example, as part of our financing, and that's where our donors, when we have an opportunity to have them help us. Uh, for example, we are doing stress testing on p of particular value chains, grain or cotton, uh, any other chains. And then uh, we, we do it under certain, maybe at this point in time simplified climate change scenarios, but it helps us to develop jointly with you, Jean Piero, uh, a set of climate actions in the business operations which can be really practical. It's not just words, it's something that companies can introduce on a base-to-base -base -base basis, and then it helps to increase transparency of the value chains, and whoever buys products or inputs, whether it's uh, food retailers or food producers, uh, from these value chains and from these farmers, A, uh, they know that uh, the exact carbon uh, or climate impact of the products or input, inputs they're buying. At the same time, it allows local farmers to be included into regional or global value chains because they improve their operation and then other players like LDC, for example, or uh, from other uh, uh, regions can, uh, can work with them. So. I would say finance plays a very important role, but finance cannot act alone. It has to be jointly with all the stakeholders. Uh, yes, I think I'll thanks, stop thanks here. A lot. No, you've covered a lot of space, and, and actually I quite like your reference to tolerance to mistake. I think this is something we need, we need to, to, to think how to operationalize. So we talked about uh, uh, initiatives in the private sector. We talked about the role of finance. I'd like to move now to Martial to speak about the public sector. You know, FAO is leading organization in, in developing the uh, guidance about, uh, about what are the enabling regulatory environment that support investments to decarbonize the food value chains. 
I'd like to, to hear from you, you know, what you recommend to governments when they come to you and ask advice about you know, how to support uh, the food value chains to decarbonize. And particularly, I would be very interested to learn a bit more about what you would advise when it comes to incentivizing or, let's say, uh, facilitating, I would say, investments from the private sector. Uh, very interesting and complex question. <laughs> So uh, now, uh, as you were mentioning, FAO is working, designing, supporting the design of policy that uh, will shape uh, the future. Um, in in terms of uh, policies, we have uh, the right momentum. So there is plenty of opportunity. They started with the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement is built, uh, as you know, on what the country can offer in terms of mitigation and uh, what are their needs in terms of adaptation. So it's already encouraged since the beginning, it's the blood of the country. So the country wants to move on that. Uh, at FAO, we are looking at uh, where agriculture is in the different NDC. So the NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, that is a policy, political instrument country will use to implement uh, their action. On 41% of the NDC nowadays, and this number is increasing because countries are putting forward their new NDC. So already 41% of uh, the countries are saying that the realization of their NDC should go hand in hand with uh, more involvement in the, of the private sector. So already you have that recognition that countries are saying basically we can do, we can provide some kind of guidance, we have uh, the, the direction, but we need also the support of the private sector. Um, this is something also IPCC just remember to, to us. Uh, you, you, we had uh, the last report of IPCC, the special report of land. Or what all those reports are saying basically that we have no solution. We have all to be involved in finding the way to decarbonization. Uh, one of the speakers were mentioning the mainstreaming of decarbonization in the society. It is there. So, no, or to enable and um, to find the enabling environment to ensure that public sector will really draft the right policies and also that will be a game changer in terms of investment. So here we are at, uh, in Glasgow and I strongly believe in the force of a strong political signal. For instance, within the, the convention, you have a specific track of negotiation. It's an item of negotiation. The name is quite a little bit complex, Corinivia Joint Work on Agriculture. So but, but for the first time ever, you have a specific debate in a climate change arena, climate change convention on agriculture. And here they can provide to the world a strong signal identifying the no regret option. And hopefully, we have plenty of no regret options. I can provide you so, some examples. For instance, avo avoiding burning of agricultural residues. Everyone agrees that the worst you can do with agricultural residues is to burn them. You can do plenty of other options. And then uh, perhaps there is no agreement. That it will be really con context specific. You can either collect, uh, you can either do bioenergy, let on the field to sequester carbon, you can feed animals with soya. But we have some kind of uh, a no regret option clearly identified. Work, invest, and avoid burning. The same for livestock, for instance. We know that healthy animal you are moving uh, uh, to increase or to optimize the system. So this, this is what uh, we are expecting for the negotiator of agriculture, for Coronivia, to, to give that signal we need, saying that, look, we have identified several options that are no regret. And then this strong signal can influence a lot. It can influence having more agriculture in the NDC, in the willingness of the country, but also all the different stakeholders, private sector will, will also have a, a, a clear vision where to go. Finance will also move on that. And uh, I, I was just uh, this morning in uh, other side event uh, with a French development agency, with the other bank. Um, they, uh, you can see they have all the same concern. We have a portfolio of investment or to ensure that all investment are good for climate, but uh, not also for climate, uh, for 
what we all have here for all the different SDG. So it's complex. We, we know it's a, it's a complex issue. But today, we have plenty of, let's say, assets in our hand that we can tackle that uh, ob objective. Uh, one of the speakers were mentioning data. Today, we have access to big data. We never had so many data as we have today. So we need really to activate all those data to provide the tool we need to provide the information and the direction. And those tools are, are there. So basically, we need all together to work to activate them and to provide uh, the, the best, let's say, pathway. So uh, this is perhaps uh, the shortest answer I can provide to you. Thank, thank you very much, Marcial. Uh, before moving to, I think, the, the last round of consideration, I, I'd like to uh, just uh, raise a couple of quick questions, you know, one for Anastasia. Uh, you, you talked before about carbon, uh, carbon instruments, you know, your work in uh, 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 creating carbon offset mechanisms. Can you tell us how much you believe in these market opportunities? You know, on, uh, on what basis, which expectations you have, you're investing, in fact, in, uh, in developing these products? Um, oh, thank you. So the very first expectation, if we are talking about, um, if we are talking about potential off takers, and when it comes to trade actually the credits via the markets for carbon offsets, we are expecting at least three options here. Those are clients from the EU and the US with the same set of uh, decarbonization targets, both clients from agribusiness and from other sectors. Um, those are also our own international affiliates in Switzerland and the US. And in a longer term perspective, it's a mandatory emission trading scheme uh, that is under development in, in Ukraine. And so those are actually the options that we, and the expectations that we see in terms of trade. And um, in terms of environmental effect, you, so those measures that we are going to take in terms of sustainability, sustainable farming, in terms of uh, regenerated farming, uh, this will give a long lasting environmental impact for us as a company, and uh, this will, we can not only qualify or quantify, because um, using cover crops or composting or using uh, wooden biomass, uh, this will increase, uh, essentially increase our yields and thus uh, the general effect, uh, economic effect for the company. But that's also, and at the same time, creates really positive uh, um, environmental effect and gives this carbon benefit for the company. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, Guy, uh, perhaps a final question for you. Uh, uh, there are a lot of talks about you know, greenwashing. Even yesterday, Greta Thunberg uh, mentioned it in, uh, in her speech. Um, it clearly is about you know, how credible are the claims the claims that different organizations, particularly private sector organizations, make in respect to decarbonization objectives and impact. I'm interested to learn from you again. You're an organization really in the middle, so you have to look at these claims from both sides. So how do you verify the credibility of these claims? What type of uh, uh, systems you, you, you can put in place to really be sure that the information you provide to your customers can be uh, uh, verified and can be uh, defended? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it is it is a great question. And I mean, it is an area of, of genuine concern. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of the skepticism around, uh, you know, efforts that a company like mine or our sector might make or companies in other sectors might make can be can be justified. So the, the way to counter that is, is really with with credible data put into the public domain that isn't necessarily just your say so it it is externally verified by an acknowledged and and credible third party um, again that adds to expense and cost but if that is uh, a cost that needs to be paid in in food supply chains then then fair enough um, but I think, you know, the, the, I think it was touched on earlier as well, the sort of systematic approach to reporting in an area like carbon 
where there is an accepted uniformity adopted by the marketplace, be it sectorally or globally or, or whatever, will also be important. So, um, you know, initiatives that, that seek to report uh, in a uniform way, you know, allows companies to benchmark themselves against the marketplace to, to monitor progress and see how they're doing, um, as well as giving that marketplace uh, a view of the extent to which you know, companies are, are on the right track. Uh, I think there's always going to be some skepticism that, you know, companies in our sector are, are potentially greenwashing or, you know, trying to communicate up our sustainability efforts. And it's a trap that uh, we as a sector should try not to fall into. It's not like financial reporting. I think you need to be you know, more straightforward and honest. And if you are, those sorts of reporting initiatives tend to be applauded. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's a, a challenge to present the true picture, but the most important thing is to be on some form of, of improvement plan, to have goals in place that say, you know, we're here now and next year or in three years time, we want to be you know, we want to have progressed up the up the scale to to position X, um, and judge us on those efforts. So those sorts of of elements related to to reporting are are important. And again, I think I think your sector is leading the way in many senses in terms of the demands that it is putting on our sector as a quid pro quo for the provision of finance lines which is great because as I say, that reinforces the business case as to why we need to move in a particular direction. Thanks a lot, Guy. I'd like now to close the session with, with a quick question for, uh, for all the speakers. Really 30 seconds, you know, please tell me what you would advise a private company, we have many connected with us today, what are the two, three key steps they have to take in order to start the process of decarbonize their, pro their uh, operations? So really, 30 seconds each. Natalia. Well, I would say be brave and bold. Don't uh, delay action. Uh, ensure at the same time the, uh, that your business model uh, is profitable and sustainable and work with the BID. We have a strong appetite for green, digital, and inclusive uh, pathways. Thank you. Martial, your so take on it. In 30 seconds on just one, I would say we need standard metrics that are easy to handle, cost-effective, and hopefully FAO can offer some kind of uh, such metrics. Uh, you know, in livestock, we have a Gleam tool. Uh, we have a REC soil, on, uh, that is an initiative on, on, on soil that can offer you the potential to sequester carbon. And we are developing new tools like the uh, ABC map for adaptation by diversity and carbon map, where we can offer a mapping of the impact of the different uh, options you will uh, decide. So matrix on standard. Thank you. Uh, Anastasia, your view on this? Uh, I guess the key success factor here is a will. It's uh, and also team's efforts and um, it's about catalyzing investments and it's also about combination of uh, uh, different activities because decarbonization is uh, going far beyond greenhouse gas emissions or sequestrations. These projects are about intelligent farming, smart technologies, climate resilient infrastructure, innovations and huge investments. And um, yeah, with, with all those steps and with this understanding and with a strong will, uh, you have to and with your daily sustainable comprehensive activities and practices, you have and you ought to be the company uh, in the road that needs your helping hand. Thank you. Uh, Nuno, your, your take on this. Hello. Hi. So I think, um, as I said, I think companies, I agree with, with Natalia and with the others that companies need to be bold. Uh, and I think it will, as we said, it will depend, depend very much on the companies that we're talking about. Uh, uh, different companies uh, will face different incentives to do this, particularly in a situation where 
carbon is not yet appropriately priced. Um, and so I think be bold and, and I think also go for uh, solid service providers that support you in this journey. I think uh, while there's a lot of confusion, and as we said, and I think also Guy and Anastasia mentioned, there are issues with tools, methods, databases, data. I think some providers are better than others. The same goes for carbon credits. You have credits that go from $3 without any certification up to 30 or 40 or $50 a ton. So you need, if you're offsetting, go for quality uh, and go for, for third-party verification and for, for good service providers. This until we get a system that is more harmonized and where I think then we can have uh, companies thriving in, their, in, in terms of achieving their carbon or low carbon goals. Thank you, Nuno. Uh, Guy, over to you. Yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with all of the comments from, from colleagues so far. I would add one more area. I think uh, collaboration really uh, is, is paramount here across stakeholders, but also within sectors, I think. This is such an important area as to be sort of beyond a competitive issue. Uh, and its criticality is such that we, we all need to benefit from one another's experiences, negative and positive, uh, in order to, to change the way you know, food systems operate for the better. So sharing information, data, you know, being coercive and, and collaborative is, is really, really important. Thank you, Guy. And with this, we have to close this session. It has been a very informative conversation. And on behalf of the FAO and the EBRD, I really like to uh, thank all our speakers and, and panelists, um, and also, of course, all the uh, uh, guests connected online. Uh, it has been very informative for me, uh, and I would like to uh, wish you uh, a good continuation of COP. And please continue to follow FAO and EBRD at COP26. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.